2023. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Approved. Uh, we, any, here's what we'll do this. We'll hear from the public on Mr. Chairman, subject. Mr. Chairman, we have uh, no public for general, uh, no comments for general public. Oh, okay, comments. let's skip it then. Let's go to staff update. All right, before we get started, uh, just a reminder that in compliance with the Freedom of Information Act, notice of meetings and agendas were posted and furnished to all news and media outlets and persons requesting notification. All right, we have a total of seven projects, uh, seven project applications for the summer F FY24 cycle. Uh, three rural and four urban. Um, if approved, it would add a total of 238 acres to the Greenbelt program uh, at a cost of about 4.5 million in Greenbelt funds. Um, all, well, six of the seven are fee simple once again, no conservation easements again this cycle. Um, and our total match being offered is 2.8 million. This shows the geographic spread of all seven projects. You'll see it's centered right around the center of the county. Um, even the three rural projects on Johns Island, Main, Main Road Park, and the two Betsy Carrison Nature Trail projects uh, are loaded, located just outside of the urban growth boundary with the two Betsy Carrison being literally right across the street from the urban growth boundary and Main Road uh, fairly close as well. Um, so now we'll take a look at the funding requests for each project. Again, we have the three projects on James Island in the rural column, Betsy Carrison Nature Trail Phase 2, Phase 3, and the Main Road Park acquisition. The total request from the rural funds would be $2.4 million, and if approved, that would leave a balance of seven, just under $17.9 million in the rural funds. Um, next are our urban projects. And the first one is the Beefield Community Park project on James Island. That request is for just over $712,000. And again, that is an urban unincorporated request. And we, we knew this was coming as we were doing our five-year plan review last year. Um, we knew that the urban unincorporated was forward spent uh, at over $4 million. So if this were approved, that would extend the deficit um, to negative 4.7 million. Um, we'd still have 2.6 million left in the lifetime allocation balance for Urban Unincorporated. Uh, now, one other, this property would also qualify for the Small Landowner Program. Small Landowner Program has about $50,000 left in that. So, um, to be able to fund this project, we would either need to go further negative on the urban unincorporated um, or make some recommendations with your recommendation to council on potentially recapitalizing the small landowner program, which can fund projects in both the urban and rural areas. Next project is the town of Mount Pleasant. It's another Mount Pleasant Way project. Uh, request is for $620,200. This one would be along Park Avenue and Carolina Park Boulevards in northern Mount Pleasant. Uh, if approved, that would leave Mount Pleasant a balance of over $1 million and plenty in the lifetime balance as well. City of North Charleston is requesting $734,500. If approved, leaving them with over $3.8 in their current allocation. Um, Town of Sullivan's Island with their minor improvement project for um, beach access. That request is $51,000, which would just about zero out uh, their current allocation, leaving them a lifetime allocation of just under $400,000. So when we look at our totals, total urban request is for 2.1 million, leaving just under 3.1 million for the next cycle in FY24, and over 80,000 in the lifetime allocation. And total rural and urban, uh, just over 4.5 million requested from Greenbelt, 
and just under, if approved, uh, 20.1 million that would be available for the rest of the cycle or for the rest of the year. Any questions on the, on the table? Okay. We'll move right into our, our first project. I'll give a brief summary of each project and then turn it over to the presenter for a more uh, in-depth look at their projects. First one is the Betsy Carrison Nature Trail Phase 2, um, which is being requested by Kiowa Island Natural <laughs> Habitat Conservancy. It is a fee simple request in the rural area. It is also a reimbursement request. Um, if approved, it would protect 15.3 acres and provide some public access along that corridor. And uh, the match that they are offering is 100%. Um, so now I've got Kali Farah, Land Protection Specialist with the Kiowa Conservancy. Um, he's going to come and give you his presentation. Kali, we've got your, uh, your laser pointer ready nice. on the mouse because that one will not work. Okay. Um, this will click slide. Yeah, down, upper band. Okay, good deal. Good morning. Uh, thank you all again. This is awesome to be before you all. Again, I think we have a couple very exciting projects to present to you. Um, again, Betsy Carrison Nature Trail Phase 2 is the first one I will present. Uh, I'm Kali Farah. I'm the Land Preservation Specialist for the Kiowa Conservancy. And uh, I've also got several other colleagues with me here today. Um, so again, as a recap, the Kiowa Conservancy is um, an accredited nonprofit land trust on Kiowa Island. So historically, we preserved land just on Kiowa Island, but with our new strategic plan, uh, we decided to branch outside of Kiowa and also work in the surrounding Sea Islands. So this kind of shows our geographical scope of work uh, historically on Kiowa Island, and then we decided we need to move outside of Kiowa and include Johns Island, Seabrook, and the surrounding islands all through a watershed approach. Um, we know that everything ultimately that happens on Johns Island affects Kiowa and vice versa. We also share the same wildlife. Um, and this kind of shows, as we start to move on to Johns Island, um, our initial focus is along Betsy Garrison Parkway. Uh, we've seen over the last year or two, this onslaught of development pressures. Um, and this is a, a beautiful area that we see is really important to protect, not just for wildlife, but for scenic and historical and cultural significance. And then we will start to move out as well into River Road and Bohagate. So, Betsy Carrison Nature Trail Phase 2, it's a roughly 15-acre property that just is just off of Betsy Carrison Parkway. Uh, around eight acres of it is made up of the highland off of the parkway, and then the remaining uh, six acres is made up of four uh, large hummock islands that extend out to Bohigga Creek. Um, the habitat type within is mostly maritime forest with also some salt shrub thicket. Um, and as we go through, uh, this is going to give you a nice aerial view to be able to get a sense of place on, on Betsy Carrison Parkway. Um, and as I go through here as well, um, this is kind of our vision as we're, as we're a wildlife-centered organization, that comes first. And so um, this kind of shows how we believe um, with land preservation that's already taken place and that to come in the future, this will create a wildlife corridor is what we're ultimately working toward. And so to show some interior photos of the Hummock Islands and, and the mainland itself, dense maritime forest, um, a great buffer um, to a heavily traveled highway. Um, it cr creates natural infrastructure, holds natural infrastructure, um, and pr helps hold that urban growth boundary line as well with this rural nature. And so here, I'm just gonna give kind of a, a video that shows an overview of the property. This is Betsy Garrison Parkway in the front. Kiowa is to the right. We're starting to move back towards the Hummock Islands. This is the bulk of the main property here. It's starting to get over the start of the marsh lines now.
And so as we look into the vision for the property, our overall goal, um, one, is to protect wildlife habitat, but there's also a way to incorporate some public access to this as well. Um, and that's where we see the nature trail coming in. Um, this would be our second nature trail on Betsy Harrison Parkway. Uh, the nature trail would begin right off the existing sidewalk of Betsy Harrison Parkway. Um, it would loop through the property, um, and then we have gotten preliminary approval so that we could put a boardwalk um, to the closest hummock island that would also, uh, where the trail would extend for those that want to go farther. Um, viewing benches would be placed throughout the property along with uh, na uh, signage for our native flora and fauna to educate our visitors. Um, and then we kind of get into the historical significance of this land as well. Um, this land and a lot of land along the Betsy Carrison Parkway and going up Bohicket uh, was used during the Battle of Hollover Cut. Um, and this is documented historical significance about these, the troops of both the Union um, and uh, the Confederate soldiers being moving up through this property and these properties that we were presenting to you specific. <clears throat> Um, and so this gives you a little bit of insight on what some of the signage would look like, educating the visitors on what the native flora and fauna be there, along with um, some footbridges that would get you over the low-lying areas. Um, and so now what I'm showing you is an overall view and how this piece fits into the overall scheme. Uh, so Betsy Carrison Nature Trail Phase 2 is up at the top. What I'll present in a minute is Betsy Carrison Nature Trail Phase 3. And then at the bottom, just a quarter mile away, is what was approved in the last funding cycle, Betsy Carrison Nature Trail Phase 1. And so the, what this highlights now is other pending conservation um, efforts that we have ongoing. We've talked about the easement in the past. Um, is still ongoing. And then um, we are also working on the piece in between these two nature trails as well um, to see if we can get that in so that can be contiguous preservation. And when you're looking at this as a whole now, you're looking at over 45 acres preserved um, within this quarter mile area. And this further shows the connectivity and how um, it's easily accessible um, to all these sites, especially from uh, phase three, which I'll get into in a minute. Uh, and then as we look at the broad scheme, in yellow, what you'll see is everything that's already been preserved in the area, either by us or Low Country Land Trust or another organization. Um, and then what is in purple are pending conservation projects, and in blue is what has either already been approved by y'all or what we are presenting to you today. Um, and so this gives the overall vision that we have in, in creating a wildlife corridor in Betsy Harrison. And uh, so with that, before I get into the next project. Some questions. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to open up for some questions. Anybody from the committee? Yeah. <clears throat> I, got a, I have a question just, um, <clears throat> and I don't know if you have any of your backup slides or whatever, but other properties that you'll have um, preserved, do you have any samples of the work that you've done as far as building these nature trails? Yeah, so on Kiowa Island, we have several areas on our conservation easements that are open to the public that have, have trails and such on them that we've worked with the Kika, the community association with the town and implemented those. I don't have any of that in this project though. My question is, you have four islands. We're only con going to connect the one that's all that DHEC would allow us to do um, based on their regulations. It's based on size. We were only allowed to be able to get 200 feet of boardwalk, and that will, from the critical lines, it'll only get to that first time to come. Not at the moment. Just wait till I, we hear the next one, I guess. Okay, great. Okay. I think we do have someone signed up for public comment. Um, oh, for this one? I think for phase three. I think for just phase three. Okay. You're ready to do phase three. Just do phase three. Awesome. Okay. Do you want to do that? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So, Betsy Carrison Nature Trail phase three. This is a key component in the middle. Um, that we see really important. Uh, we actually close on this property uh, this week. This is three acres in size, but it is the key component to allowing and keeping the public, or really emphasizing that public access to these properties. Um, this site in specific, um, 
will be our parking and public access area for those that want to visit our nature trails. They can easily park here. We'll even have some restoration opportunities I'll, I'll state on in the back. Um, but this is where people will come to be able to park and then easily get to our various nature trails along the parkway. Um, existing on the property right now, um, it's currently used by Rosebank Farm Stand. They're moving over to Kiowa River. Um, there's a maritime forest setting in the middle and in the back are three housing structures and an open field as well. Uh, to get you oriented, uh, again, we've got phase two here, one property in the, in the middle, and then this is our uh, phase three below. Again, kind of showing that connectivity on how close and proximity it is to the other various nature trails on the parkway. Um, you're only you know, 300 feet from, from phase two with phase three, um, and only really a quarter mile at the farthest from phase two to phase one. Again, showing that connectivity to preserve lands, our view for this wildlife uh, corridor and how these properties are tied together. I have some interior shots of the property. Uh, this is from Betsy Harrison Parkway, looking at what would be the pervious parking lot here and their sign. Um, this is the maritime forest setting in the middle. Um, and then there's an access road on the right side of the property that ultimately leads to the back where some housing structures currently exist. Again, some aerial shots. Uh, so current conditions, as stated, the Rosemont Farm Stand, impervious parking lot in the front, um, three housing structures. What we want to do is return this property to its undeveloped natural state. Um, once uh, we have an agreement with Rosemont, they're going to be gone by Christmas. Um, so that's when their site at Kiowa River will be finished. What that will become in the front um, is a parking area for our visitors along with some picnic tables um, and some restoration projects in the back. So what we're emphasizing here is habitat restoration, community engagement, and public access. And so we've got some renderings done so you can kind of get an idea of what the end vision is. Uh, Betsy Carrison on the right coming into our parking lot um, and then where Rosebank currently is will be passive green space with picnic tables, signage, um, about the historical significance in the area, native plants, and so forth. Um, and then as we kind of transition to the back, where that open field was, has the opportunity um, for native pollinator gardens um, and also interpretive signage as well. Um, and then what I will let my guest speakers here talk about in a minute is that we're going to have the ability to have a sweetgrass demonstration farm um, to educate the importance of the cultural significance behind the sweetgrass. Um, and then also a habitat restoration zone. So the three buildings that we talked about earlier will be demolished and removed from the site and that area will be restored using native plants. Again, overall vision um, in the back with the rendering, being able to have this sweet grass farm for demonstration, habitat restoration, and really this is the key component to our public access. Uh, that was interpretive science. So now what I'd like to do is uh, introduce Corey Alston and Marilyn Hemingway to say a few things um, about the historical significance and cultural aspect of this project. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, Corey Alston. I'm from the Mount Pleasant, South Carolina area. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, Sweetgrass Basket Organization and the weavers that has been trying to keep this skill alive dating back generations. I'm a proud weaver myself. I have a business that's being operated in the uh, Charleston City Market. Um, uh, what I have been blessed to be a part of is this uh, the Kiowa Conservancy. The relationship that we are building is something that um, has, been, has been very uh, future generational helping of our community of, of sustaining materials. Uh, we do have other projects that has been um, that we're working on. We have a private 1,400 plant planted uh, in the Johns Island community already, and that is to help sustain us basket makers of material. I have a slight sample of um, what we are liking and what we are having issues of finding. So this here was harvested on Johns Island. Uh, the texture is what we need. It's not. Uh, this is a native grass, this is sweet grass, um, mo mo that Molenberger grass, if you want to call it that, but the culture, the basket makers, we call it sweet grass, and the texture that we're finding in other places is so thick, so coarse, that the, that the basket makers of older generations 
uh, older weavers, I'm sorry, are not able to apply and pull and make it um, flexible. So what we're wanting is definitely is to partner with this concept of having an opportunity of planting that sweet grass there on the property, um, giving also uh, sweet grass demonstrations on the education and the knowledge of what makes us a unique culture. Um, as we are able to plant those 1,400 plants, that, that project that the, the Kiowa Conservancy and I and, and uh, Ms. Marilyn Hemingway are trying to put together will then supply those basket makers of materials, what we're lacking so much of. Um, if we can also make this project here work, we'll also plant the same seedlings. It's, gonna, it's a non-fertilized process of just taking the seeds. Those seeds bloom around the fall months. And what the, the Kiowa Conservancy has done is planted them in, the, in little pots with no fertilizing, and that's what we're hoping will then sustain us as we move forward for generations of uh, having materials. Um, that's it for me. I'm Corey Alston. Thanks for hearing me. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Marilyn Hemingway. I am CEO and founding president of the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce and the Gullah Geechee Chamber Foundation. And I have to tell you that I am delighted to be here this morning in support of phase three um, being presented by the Kiowa Conservancy because they took a talking point that I brought to their attention while we were putting together uh, the project that we're working on now that Corey just mentioned, the 1,400 plants, the private farm. And I mentioned to them, why don't we have an area where we can bring the public and teach them the process and the culture of the sweet grass? And they took that and very seriously are trying to make that happen. So I'm delighted to be here in support of this project. Why is this important? This passive park will incorporate science, culture, and ecotourism. In 2021, the Gullah Geechee Culture Heritage Corridor Commission, and I am a commissioner, by the way, um, did a market research report that indicated Gullah Geechee culture tourism potential was $34 billion a year. We are in the process of creating that infrastructure to take potential into reality. This park will be part of that infrastructure. In one month, we are launching the Gullah Geechee Seafood Trail, and it, is, and it is our hope that the Betsy Carrison Nature Trail Phase 3 will be placed on this tourism destination marketing tool where visitors will have an opportunity to visit uh, our Gullah Geechee landmarks, experiences, restaurants, and more. We will consider this a landmark to take potential into reality. Um, the Phase 3 Nature Trail is also located near a Gullah Geechee owned bed and breakfast. So if you can imagine folks visiting this park and partaking of the Nature Trail, staying at that bed and breakfast, that's real economic impact. So that's why I'm here this morning in support of this project, strongly in support of this project, and we ask that you approve the funding. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you all for, for coming up. Um, any questions that I can answer? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. When I visited the project, um, the building that housed the market was there. Are you leaving it there? No, so they will be gone by Christmas. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I thought you said that you were going to leave that up when we no, were there. No, that will be gone. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question about the the baskets in the uh, the sweet grass. Is mm -hmm. is your vision that there'll be a, a number of stalls there as well for sales? I mean, will it be an all? I mean, I, that would be a big attraction. It would seem to me to get people into your into into your different areas. Yeah, that's um, a great question. And actually, we discussed that yesterday for the potential to even have you know a stand there where someone could advertise um, their baskets and sell them. Um, and I told her that is not something that I had um, asked Eric about to see if that's even a possibility. If it is, I think it's something that would be great to add into the, the project. So. I see no issue with that. We have multiple Greenbelt properties that generate revenue and, and do have small um, commercial options. And this would obviously be a great demonstration from start to finish on sweetgrass basket making. 
Can, can you go back to the red line pedestrian accesses to yes. each of those properties? There you go. And so is that just kind of utilizing the existing bike path or how is that, how are you making that obvious, obviously connected so that people will actually do it? Mm -hmm. So this red line is really kind of on the right side of the road, but it needs to be over here. Um, so it is on the same side as these properties and it's existing sidewalk that extends all the way down Betsy Carrison Parkway, all the way to the roundabout of Kiowa Island. Um, and so those that would come would be able to park at this parking area in the middle of both nature trails and then be able to access, use the sidewalk to get to both trails from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what is the time frame for delivery of that like we see it? Like so when, when could somebody do that full movement? Yes, so we anticipate having um, this first open to the public, this site, um, by 20, at the end of, beginning of 2024, really the whole thing finished by the end of 2024, but first public access would be in the beginning of 2024, I believe. Um, and then this nature trail here um, would be also completed just before um, this site is done. So right in the beginning of 2024 is when the nature trail, I believe, is when we had that scheduled to be completed. I have to look back at the dates, but that way, as soon as this is open to the public, they would be able to access this nature trail. I can't guarantee all the signs would, that are going to be in there would be in there, but at least the trail will be created. It's going to be a earthen um, trail that is not uh, permeable, no materials. It's just um, signage to get, keep you on the cleared path. Do you have anything to Sounds add to the time frame? <clears throat> yeah. We're going to do this on lump sum of the two projects together or one at a time. I'm voting. That's up to you, Mr. Chairman. I'd say do it together. Sure. Correct. Do I have a motion? Yeah. Um, quick question before a motion. Go yeah. ahead. Um, do we need to specifically allow for a basket stand? Um, during our motion slash recommendation, or is that something that can happen? I don't think it specifically needs to be in your motion. Okay. And Eric, this might be more for you, but like for this is more, this is not trying to pick on them or anybody else, but like when, when we have these that are pledging certain things at certain time frames, how do we, how do we hold any of these to any, anybody who applies to those time frames? Um, you know, the grant agreement outlines our relationship with those that receive funds from us. And typically there is no penalty or reversion clause or anything like that, um, unless you all recommend some special condition that says if this property isn't opened in three years, then it's going to transfer to another eligible Greenbelt Fund recipient. That's happened in the past very rarely. Um, mm -hmm. but it's just good faith basically. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe the intent, the idea also is that, um, you know, we, we do want public access and actually next, next month when you have your GAB meeting, you're going to get a full update. Well, I've already sent out that information in table format, uh, but on every project that has not fully completed all the public access improvements or other improvements to the site that they said they were going to do in their application. And during the application process, um, you know, we'll, we'll provide you an update on that and you'll see that, that there are some that have taken, that have made no progress and some have, but mm -hmm. okay. as it stands now, unless you, unless you all recommend some special condition with a hard deadline, and repercussions to that and council approves that there's nothing in the standard grant agreement language that requires it well, maybe we'll address that at the greater gab but i would rec i would motion for approval of both as written I'll second. Second. all in favor aye aye, aye. 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 Have it. thank you thank you all so much okay So we're doing Main Road next? Yes, sir. Do we need to note that uh, Mr. Samuelson's accusing himself? That's right. Uh, the cha chairman performed uh, his 
business perform the appraisal on the property, so he's going to go grab a quick cup of coffee and recuse himself from this discussion and vote. Um, and the next project is the Main Road Park acquisition. That's an application from Low Country Land Trust. It's for 41 acres, fee simple, in the rural area, um, just outside of the urban growth boundary. And the request is for $1,315,500 uh, with a match of 37% being offered. And the intent, as you will see uh, from Natalie Olson, the Sea Islands Program Director, is for this to be a both combination active and passive park. Um, and as the name suggests, it is just off of Main Road on Johns Island. Natalie? You're welcome. The laser pointer is still good. Alrighty. Good morning. My name is Natalie Olson. I'm the Sea Islands Program Director for the Lowcountry Land Trust. Thank you all for the opportunity to present this project and for your consideration. The Main Road Park project is an incredible opportunity on Johns Island for us to meet our green space goals, both in terms of protecting land from development and offering some active public access, access space, which is very much needed on the island. So I'll start out talking a little bit about the, the partnership um, that was formed in this project because it's really it, it's a unique and exciting opportunity for both of our organizations. The Lowcountry Land Trust was formed in 1986. We um, hold conservation easements and fee simple properties all along the coast of South Carolina. We've done over 400 projects, um, over 47 Greenbelt projects, so we've got some a, a good track record. Um, and the Barrier Island Little League was established in the 1950s. It was formerly called the Low Country Little League, changed their name about 10 years ago. They incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit about five years ago. Um, it serves the youth on Johns Island, James Island, parts of West Ashley, Kiowa, Seabrook, Hollywood, Ravenel. It's a very big service area. Um, ages 4 to 15, there's 35 baseball teams, 7 softball teams. They have an umpire training program. It's a very robust, successful little league program that everybody loves um, that I've been hearing a lot about as I've been working with them over the last months. Um, Right now, they play on two fields at St. John's Water Company, which is on Maybank Highway, and one field at the First Baptist Church on Maybank Highway. But um, that is very, very few fields for the amount of kids that are currently playing, um, and so it limits practice, but it also limits the amount of kids that can enroll in the league generally. And so as an example, because of the limit of fields, they, turned away, they had to turn away 80 T-ball kids last year because there's not enough fields. So T-ball age children want, want to be playing and this is an opportunity for us to give them the space to do that and to offer this to, to all, of, all of the kids that want to play. So in this partnership, um, the Little League has been looking for space for, for a long time and approached the Low Country Land Trust. Um, and together we kind of worked through this vision of solving these two need, some of these two needs on Johns Island. So protecting land from development is a huge deal on Johns Island, but also in Charleston County. I think there's a lot of folks that get frustrated with infrastructure and with the population growth and, and having the amenities like open spaces to be able to support that population. And I think Johns Island fits in that category of being underserviced. And so a project that's going to offer offer public access is going to be a huge benefit, I think, to the island. So we identified this property um, as a fee simple acquisition. It's 41 acres. It's actually two parcels. One parcel is 40 acres. One of them is a one acre parcel. It is outside the urban growth boundary, but very close. It's zoned rural residential, which is one house per three acres. You can kind of see on this aerial here, there's a neighborhood, and I've got another side coming up, um, with about third acre lots right on, on one side, and then you've got Main Road on the other side. And then, so if you go west, you hit a bunch of residential subdivision. If you go, or if you go east, I'm sorry, if you go west, you hit cow fields. So it is kind of the definition of right outside of the urban growth boundary in that transition zone that's uh, very threatened by uh, residential development. So what we're proposing with this project is a bargain sale purchase of this property and then transfer it to the Little League. 
the concept, which I'll go into <clears throat> more as, as I go through these slides, is to have about 30% of the property be active open space, and that's the open cleared area that you see. Um, and that would be the area used by the Little League. And then the rest of it, the 70%, would be undisturbed natural forest managed just as, as a buffer to residential neighborhoods. Um, the view along Main Road would be preserved, and it, it'd be a nice passive green space potentially in the future. So some of the public benefits of this project, um, I've mentioned a little bit protection of low country natural resources and infrastructure, rural green space with passive and active use. Um, the property contains about 17 acres of forested wetlands, about 16 acres of upland forest, and then the remainder is open space. Um, as you all know, Wetlands, upland areas contribute significantly to air quality, water quality, flooding, is flooding issues on the island. You know, there's, there's a, a big difference between a property like this being paved and houses on it versus remaining in its natural state in terms of what kind of value it can bring to the community and the ecological services. So it's, it, you know, these, the forests on the property have been intact in that way for, for a long time and offer a great habitat refuge, a uh, place for flood water, um, and will be a good buffer to some of the active uses on the property. More of the public benefits, I mentioned the uh, frontage on Main Road. There's about a thousand feet of frontage on Main Road and um, as you all I'm sure know that that road is one of the most heavily trafficked on the island. That stretch there I think the, the latest traffic study that I saw puts about 16,000 cars a day on that stretch. And so this property is extremely visible. And in an area outside the growth bound, urban growth boundary where we're seeing, you drive around and you really see cleared lots. Like that, that seems to be the new thing on John's Island. If, if it's something new, it's a cleared lot. And so I think preserving this view shed is gonna go a long way, both for the residents of John's Island those that are passing through, but also for the character of the island. You know, we talk about preserving it, the, the island's rural character, and sometimes that means wooded frontage, sometimes that means farms, sometimes it means, you know, water, waterfront views. But here, it's an extremely visible stretch of forested wetlands. Um, I mentioned earlier, it fortifies the urban growth boundary. It's a little difficult to see, but on the right-hand side, you can see the yellow kind of dotted line. That's the urban growth boundary. There's a lot of denser residential development. Uh, the Sea Island Preserve, the former lumber tract on Main Road, is just to the south of this parcel, along with the Berkeley Electric um, Cooperative District Office. And so the location of this piece for the project that we're talking about is absolutely ideal. We're very close to residential neighborhoods, so we're serving young families, which is a lot of the population growth on the island, but it's also adjacent to active agricultural areas that are going to be threatened if we keep putting houses right up next door. So it, it's a it's a good it's in a good position to be a property that fortifies the urban growth boundary and sort of makes permanent that land use planning. Um, before I get into public need and support, one more thing um, just about Johns Island. Population growth has been off the charts. It's doubled in the last, I think it was 10 years, 30 years, doubled in the last 30 years. And there's no doubt this property is going to go on the market and be purchased for development if we don't purchase it for conservation. So it it's um, going to change hands and would, pr would very likely go the way of a lot of the other open spaces that we've seen being bought up by subdivision developers. So we're in the initial stages of this project and I didn't, I'm not sure if y'all got a, I, I didn't get a chance to get the support letters in full. Um, so I wanted to pull a few quotes here in case you didn't have a chance to look at them. But Low Country Land Trust received about 80 support letters. Um, Barrier Island Little League received over 200. Um, and, you know, they're across the board. It, it's really exciting reading, you know, what people would be looking forward to. A lot of support for the Little League as a community organization and the value that it provides to the youth. But also a lot of the themes that I've been talking about here were, you know, Main Road is a great location for this, po Johns Island population growth, we don't have enough space for the kids to be outside. Um, 
makes so much more sense than another subdivision to tax our roads. So um, this is just a little taste of, of some uh, of tons of the support letters that we've received throughout kind of um, the initial stages of this project. I think it also shows, and this is important kind of in the context of the long-term value that it's bringing, it shows the network of support that the Little League has. Um, I, they have, you know, I mentioned they've been around since the 1950s, but they have an extremely robust network of former players, current players, families, businesses, all sorts of people support the Little League and will do what needs to be done um, to, you know, get these kids out there and continue playing. So um, as we talk about how this project is going to unfold, I think that's important context. So real quick on the funding and leveraging, this is a request for $1.3 million and 15500 in transaction costs. The Barrier Islands Little League um, has estimated $60,000 is what it's going to take to get the two T-ball fields up and running, which is the plan for the first six months. Uh, that's the most immediate immediate need. I mentioned those 80 T-ballers that were turned away. We want to get get those kids on some teams and playing. So the, the priority would be the first two T-ball fields cost about $50,000 to establish both of those and about $10,000 to establish unpaved parking to support it. And then the land match is um, 421750 and that's the difference between the appraised value and the Greenbow request. Proposed uses and timeline, this is just an initial sketch. I mentioned we're, we're still in the initial stages of this, and so, you know, as we get more experts on the property and, and digging into the details with the, with the Little League, some of that kind of... The, the layout may change as we identify where important trees are and that sort of thing. Um, but this is the overall concept. And like I mentioned, it's 70% passive area, 30% active park uses within six months to T-ball fields. The long-term vision is to have about five fields. That would be T-ball, baseball, and softball. And then have some walking trails throughout the wooded area around it. There will be a conservation easement or deed restriction held by the Low Country Land Trust and enforced in perpetuity. That will limit the subdivisions, residences, impervious surfaces, tree impacts, development in the buffers, uses like mining, industrial, will limit commercial uses. Y'all mentioned just in the previous project about limited commercial uses that are consistent with these types of Greenbelt projects. Barrier Island Little League's concession stand is a great example of that. Every Little League field has a concession stand, and the Little League has done such a great job at managing those costs. That's actually where a bulk of the money to pay for uniforms and equipment um, and umpires and stuff for the kids comes from. And so it's important for them to have that use, but the conservation easement or deed restriction will be over the entire property, so we will be limiting those uses and the impervious surfaces um, and other things like structures and stuff like that. And as y'all can imagine, the restrictions in the wooded area will be a lot more restrictive than they would be in the active area. That's sort of the idea is to give the Little League the flexibility that they need in this permanent space, but have a strong set of protections that everybody can can rely on in perpetuity that we will have this, this wooded buffer and um, undisturbed wetlands and all the natural natural values that come from that. So I think that's what I had. So let's go to questions. I also just real quick, I wanted to introduce Mary Bowles. She's sitting in the audience here. She is the president of the Barrier Islands Little League. Can answer questions about the Little League, and um, you know, hopefully as we move move through the process, we'll get some. Maybe we'll get some Little League kids up here, and they can speak for themselves about how exciting this project is to them. So. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for the presenter from the board? Sure. Uh, Natalie yeah. looks good. Or... Go ahead. I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Natalie looks good. Um, I'm just curious about delivery of those fields. So, like, what what kind of budget <clears throat> does the Barrier Island Little League have? Can they do it? And then. Can they pay for it, or are y'all paying for it? And then who's going to build the trails? And when will the trails be ready? 
Okay. So to the first question, um, the Barrier Island Little League, Little League finances, and Mary can help me out with some of this, but um, essentially I, I think the, the biggest point is that the Little League has – the, in their support, they have a lot of donated goods and services. And so when we're talking about building the two Little League fields, they've lined up volunteer donated services and, um, you know, goods. So dirt, rocks, all that kind of stuff that's going to be needed for the parking. The architect they've got from the national, international Little League coming down to look at the property for free. Um, lots of businesses support the Little League and have helped them in the past with some of the things that are necessary for the fields, like lights or maintenance of it. The Barrier Island Little League board has 17 members. A lot of those members are volunteering their time and energy to help maintain the fields. Um, and so they, you know, the Little League has been around for a long time and has... It, through this network, I think there's um, a lot of confidence that this will all be done essentially with donated and volunteered services and people dedicating their time. So that's why I was underscoring a lot of the support. I think that's kind of a key element of it. Um, as far as the, the concrete commitments, the main focus, um, and especially with our application that we're most um, – you know, certain about a timeline for is the two T-ball fields. Those are, to get those up and running, it's a lot less of a lift. Uh, some of the fences and the bases and stuff and the mounds are portable, so it's a little bit, um, that will be very quick. We anticipate being able to get T-ball up and running within six six months and the parking to support that of, of the project being funded and transferred. The walking trails are is are more part of the larger vision um you know what we're trying to do I, I think the two overarching goals with this project are that are, are the active green space and protecting land from development i think the walking trails in terms of the priority list is going to be after the fields maybe after three of the fields instead of five of them um and so it's a little bit of a work in progress as we're we're figuring out how this is going to be phased. So I don't have a firm answer on the walking trails because it's more down on the priority list. Um, and so, you know, the, the undisturbed woods around the active area are going to be more of a buffer at first. And in a lot of this, you know, there, a lot of it is, is you know, taking off chewable bites what is it you don't want to bite off more than you can chew and there's a lot you know we need to get straight security liability insurance that sort of thing before there's open public access trails so um what we've discussed with the little league so far is focusing the application and uh the short-term timeline on getting those two t-ball fields together getting them playing out there getting some parking um and then working on the longer term plan after that's Okay. Done. Thank you. Ms. Folks, yes. you have something yeah, you like to add? If, yeah. if I could let Mary add to that, I'm sure that I didn't didn't get all the finances right. So. My name is Mary Bull, and I'm the president of our Little League organization this year. And next year already, I'm all told. <laughs> so, a very brief history. Seven years ago, we discovered our league was growing rapidly, as Johns Island is. Four years ago, we put together a committee to search for new land to build new fields because we are outgrowing ours. At that time, we also used Charleston Collegiate School. We lost Charleston Collegiate School last year. So that hurt us a lot. This year, we had so many kids sign up. First day of baseball season, nobody could have a practice because there was nowhere to practice unless you went to the bullpen. That was it. That was the only place they could practice. So leads, leading fields is really important. Um, I am going to say that we have talked to the county. We have talked to the city. The county says the city builds sports fields. The city says we don't have a need for them on Johns Island. We say come see our Little League program. We don't get very far with that, I'm sorry. Um, Little League is the best program there is in baseball in the world. All you have to do in August is watch the Little League World Series to know that. So in finding land, 
I reached out to Natalie because somebody told me that you could get Conservancy land and do something to it and said, please watch for any land for me, please. So I'm totally excited about getting this. We put together a committee of four to write up our dream fields, not never even seeing the land. <laughs> and we presented that to her and showed it to her. She was like, oh my gosh, this is a long list. It's a very long list. It is on a five-year plan of what to do. We sent an email out to all of our email base, which is about 4,000 people who are in the last seven years having been involved in Little League, saying, this is our plan, this is a hopeful opportunity, and what can you do to help us? I now have a three-page list of people who have volunteered services to build new leagues. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Cost of building these fields, we are told, is going to run about $250,000 if we were to just have to flat out pay for it. We don't have that kind of money. But we've got lots of people that want to help. If there's any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them specifically. I have, I have Christine a had couple. one. Did you have Sorry. one initially? Yeah, I did. Thank you. Um, actually, my question is about the access to the property. Um, so it looks like the cleared area is at the back side of the property mm -hmm. yep. and you showed um okay well you showed that where there's some sort of um i guess dirt road already leading towards the back of the property is it the is the intent to use the same um road that's already there um yeah, will it be expanded it. will it be paved okay. so yeah, great, great question. Thank you for asking. I meant to mention that. Um, the current access to this property right now is on Main Road, right there in the middle. Um, there's just a little cutoff into Main Road, in, into the driveway of this property. Um, so that will be the primary access. There's going to be a little bit of improvements that need to be made right there where you turn into the driveway to make sure it's safe enough for two cars to be next to each other at the same time. But beyond that, the, the idea is to have the main access out front there is another access on the back side of the property to the neighborhood um, on the right there into that residential neighborhood. There's actually a road that dead ends kind of into this property. So there is a secondary access point right now. Um, we've discussed making that walking golf carts, that sort of thing for the neighborhoods there. Um, but certainly we're going to keep that in mind as um, a potential additional access point as the plans are sketched out, but um, at this point in time, the main access will be off of Main Road. Okay. And is there a plan to pave it or not? The it, no, there would be only to the extent required by law. If we have to have that mm -hmm. cut in paved um, right off a of Main Road, then that would be then that would be required by DOT. Um, but certainly, we're not going to do any paving. Um, that isn't required by law. So all of the roads, all the parking will be gravel, permeable surfaces, um, and sort of designed around the features that are there. So not cutting down trees, just to park a car there. Okay, so um, then the plan is for you all to give the property to the Little League, the, all, yes. the whole property. Yes. So ultimately, you all will be responsible not only for the fields, but for maintenance of the access. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a question for you, Natalie. How many houses could be built on that land? If you said it already, I apologize, and I apologize to everyone for being late today, but I was stuck on John's Island. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nora. Um, I did not mention the number of houses. I, I, I did mention it's zoned RR, uh, which is rural residential. It's one house per three acres. Um, there could be about, once you subtract out the wetlands, I think there could be about a dozen houses there. But I always hesitate in saying the number of houses that can go on a piece of property because every development I think we've ever seen ends up with more houses than, there, than you would think that they are. You know? And so with, with conservation subdivision zoning, with a PUD, which wouldn't necessarily be out of the norm, there are lots of different options for that to be developed in the exact same way that the third acre lots directly behind it and the half acre third acre lots at sea island preserve right down main road so 
within a couple of hundred feet, you have third acre residential lots. Um, that's not what it is currently zoned now, but if you're looking at what's what's been done on similar properties outside the urban growth boundary, those are great examples of it. So it's one house per three acres currently zoned. I just like to follow up on, on Christine's line of questioning. Is, is the Little League Association, the Barry Island Little League Association, are you on board with trails through the wooded area and, and developing those eventually? Definitely. Okay. Yes. And the public access yes. pieces. And this is only for T-ball. This is not for um, no, no. The, the larger ages. No. It's for everybody. It's for, it's for everybody. everybody? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the, the plan would be two T-ball fields and then uh, three or so softball and baseball fields for okay. the older leagues. Given that this is um, <coughs> intended to be for public access, kind of in the big picture sense, how do you manage the fields relative to like other people showing up wanting to use them on off hours or like, are you, are you, is this going to be viewed like your barrier islands fields or are they fields that are available to the public on a, I don't know, an off Saturday in the fall when there's no baseball or whatever? They will probably be more viewed as barrier island fields, but as barrier island fields are now on Johns Island, we do allow the local travel ball teams to use the field. We allow families that are having birthday parties to use the field. I've seen family reunions come have a Sunday afternoon picnic and play wiffle ball. Uh, it will be it will be able to be used by the public. Yes, I do believe so. And like, as in not locked gates, or how, how do you, how do you propose handling that? that? Right now, that is something that we're, we have talked about because security is really important for us. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, on Maybank, we have had three break-ins in the last five years with equipment being stolen, um, just plain vandalism going on. So we do want to keep things secure for people. Um, we actually even consider the opportunity of having to hire somebody that actually is going to be there in charge of the fields because we are growing so large and the number of kids that would be now involved. Yeah, so so I think in terms of, I, I mean, what we've explained in some in the application is that we're, um, that initially it's gonna be gates to just be accessed by the Little League during those times that they're playing or having um, games, but at those times it's open to the public, obviously. I mean, the, the Little League, so when they're playing or when they're practicing, the gate will be open and there will be people there, but um, the initial plan, you know, before it's built out with, with more facilities and security and whatnot will be to have it gated, that's what we've discussed. Mm -hmm. And they could go through the the Bear Island Little League to if somebody wants to use the field just like you're doing now. Oh, that's just what we do now. Yeah. In some kind of sign up format or they just request it or uh, they request it, it goes to the calendar to see if it's available. We unfortunately we say Little League is first and foremost on our fields, so if we have something going on, we have our, our events first. Our games come first. Any other questions? Anyone else? Anyone else? Can yep. I say something before sure, Nora. we vote? Uh, we're gonna, you're gonna talk to them? Well, I'm just, yeah, Or is it for the board? It. It's for them. Okay. Kind of, okay. Um, I'd like to uh, um, applaud the Little League folks for doing such a good job for so long with nothing. I've lived on the island for 24 years, and I can tell you that um, I have complete confidence in them to do in you to do whatever it takes. Thank you. Okay. No more questions. Thank you very much um, for the board. Uh, does anyone may, want to make a recommendation or a motion? We'll do, uh, I think we do have a. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a on that one, one more yes, comment? Sir.
Hi, I'm Rich Thomas. Um, I live at 4360 Betsy Carrison Parkway, which is right in between the two properties that um, Keel Conservancy are um, acquiring. Um, I've been in talks with, with Collie and Lee about my property going into that block, which would give about 30, 30 acres or so in a solid block right there. Um, there's also church property next door, which is undeveloped that extends out onto the island out in the marsh. My property goes out onto the island too. Um, it's an amazing area, <clears throat> and I'm so glad it's, it's being put into conservation, and I'd like to do the same. Um, just a few comments about that. Um, the wildlife there is amazing. Um, there's an osprey. It's taken up residence somewhere. I hear it flying around every day. The um, pileated woodpeckers are out there screaming and making noise all day long. Um, lots of other bird um, animal life. Um, I saw a black panther walk across my property about um, 13 years ago and uh, killed a deer on one of the properties that they're, that they're buying. So it's pretty amazing. It's, it's an amazing space being so close to this development that's pressuring the whole end of Betsy Carrison. Um, you know, somebody asked a question about access between those two properties. Um, I have no issue with putting a path across the front of mine that would tie those two together so that nobody would have to walk out on the road. Um, wouldn't be an issue for me, and I think it would be a great amenity. The idea of um, putting up a sweet grass basket area there is, is really amazing, too. There are um, ladies who weave baskets on the island, and one of them sells her baskets and weaves her baskets there at the farm stand right now. Um, there are others who have set up in the road, um, Betsy Carrison, and sold baskets for years. So there's a community of those people right there. Um, so that would be a great amenity as well for, for the public in general, the um, tourists coming down, um, and people who just want a little respite from, from the traffic and, and development there. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you all are in favor of that, and, and I'm... I myself am very much in favor of it as well, and I hope that I can work with them to get my property in, in similar um, conservation. Um, as far as the Little League um, property, I'm on the board of St. John's Water Company, and I'm not speaking for the board at all, but um, the water company has been providing a Little League with part of our property for their ball fields for, I don't know, years, 20 years. 28 years. So um, it's great to see them uh, having an opportunity to move to another, another property. And as Natalie and Mary mentioned, there's a huge need on John's Island for um, not only the, the ball fields, but just more protected space. And, and again, that whole area of John's Island, the development pressures are pretty amazing. So. Um, Thank you all for, for considering these projects, and um, I hope they can move forward because it'll be a tremendous amenity to um, all the residents around here. Thank you. Sir, thank you for making any the trip questions? in. And, any sir? questions? No, anybody have any questions? Okay, thank you. Yes, sir, thanks for making the trip in and uh, offering your comments in support of these projects. Any more comments? That's all that signed up. Okay. Uh, does anyone like to make a motion? I'll move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. Do we have any discussion amongst the, the board? I would just like to somehow weave into this that, that those fields need to have some degree of availability. I don't, and I don't know quite what the best procedure for that is. I don't really know how to manage athletic fields. I don't have any concept of that. But... Um, it just doesn't seem like it would be quite right if they were just locked up every time the Little League is not using them. So, so I kind of have a different opinion. You do? Okay. So, yeah. yeah, and you know more than I do about this. So. I mean, uh, fields are expensive to right. maintain. And if um, 
full-on access is allowed all the time and you've got people out there that don't have permission or what what we see with Mount Pleasant is some people that decide to use them as a dog park mm. when the fields aren't open and they, a dog can do a lot of damage to the fields. Um, I know we, um, so it's probably very similar to what this Little League does. The town has to do it too. I mean, yeah, first priority are the, the town's baseball teams, you know, whoever we have. And then as a secondary, will the, the travel teams um, will come out and have permission to use them. But it is, you know, we have a calendar. Um, and so I can appreciate that they want some sort of calendar, that they're going to have some sort of calendar, probably very similar to what the municipalities do for their fields. And I can very much appreciate the need to protect the field, not only for security, but for maintenance purposes. So that's just Well, that I, sounds good. So there's okay. a sign-up procedure. Correct. And that is reasonable? I think so. It works for us. Okay. It's okay, municip- well, then as I a guess I would just amend it that way. Just as long as there's a, a published sign-up procedure so that someone else could potentially use them going through the proper channels. Is that fair, do you think? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, I agree. Okay, so can I amend it slightly? You can. Did, um, did you make that motion? Well, I would, okay, I motion for approval. With the condition? With the condition that there's just some kind of sign-up procedure, which it sounds like there already is, for use of the fields um, in off times or non-baseball times. And then Anybody I second that? Second. Yeah. Anybody second uh, Beezer's addition to the motion? I think Nora just did. What's that? I think Nora just did. Oh, you did? Yeah. For, I'm sorry. And Nora is second that. Okay, so... Um, so for the vote, it would be to approve the project with a uh, desire made known by the board to have some sort of policy that allows and sign up that allows other people to use the a published uh, sign up plan. Okay. Does everybody understand that? Mm-hmm. Okay. I think we can massage that a little bit for the grant agreement um, as far as the language goes and between now and the GAB meeting as well. We can talk with the Little League and get that language down. Okay, sounds good. All in favor, say aye. 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 Oppose? Ayes have it. All right, that concludes our three rural projects. We're gonna take a quick 10 minute break um, for our subcommittee members. There, there are some, some coffee and a few snacks in the ante room there. Um, we'll reconvene. 1025. Oh, coffee break. Yeah. I never had to really get those very often. What's up? It's because Charlie's a chair. Here, man. <laughs> you got to make sure the coffee's flowing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that took the hour. Yeah. Yeah. Good. What took you
So for the minutes, do we need to make sure we show that uh, Ms. Samson is now the return to the chair? And now he's leaving. <laughs> Wait, I was kind of hoping we get started with that comment. Huh? Who's the alternative chair? Vice. I know. And then now he's now that he's back because he couldn't work on that last project. Right. Right. Because he did it, so now right. he's going. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring one in. <laughs> All right, Mr. Chairman, we'll move into our urban projects. First one up is Northbridge Properties, a request from City of North Charleston. Uh, fee simple in the urban area, obviously drawing from the City of North Charleston's allocation, uh, it would be to protect 172 acres, and I believe that's five different parcels right around the intersection of Cosgrove Avenue and 526. Um, just down the street here and the request is for 734,500 and no match being offered. We've got Shannon Prady from City of North Charleston Mayor's Office to provide her presentation. I'm Shannon Prady. I'm with Mayor Summy's office. This is the Northbridge properties. We have been working on this for many years. I think many of you all remember Ray Anderson. He was working on this and actually I had to go in his files and find some old notes that he had taken about this property. Um, this is for 172.9 acres, includes 16 acres of highland and 156 acres of wet. One more time with that breakdown. Uh, 16 acres of high, 156.8 of wet. Um, this property is actually owned by an LLC, which is part of the Darby Way Long family through the Beach Company. Actually, in Ray's um, handwriting yesterday, I found some history on the property. The property was actually originally owned by the Lutheran Church, and in 1930s, J.C. Long actually purchased it from it, them. And the properties um, actually access is easier if you come back through the marsh. We have actually gone through the cemetery and entered the properties or down along 26. Uh, we're thinking in terms of a passive park, a walkway. There is, as y'all may know, some discussion about a pedestrian walkway over the Ashley River, Ashley River. And this would actually be a great place to kind of make it um, enter. We, there are two billboards on the property, and I'm going to use this little clicker. One, um, come on. Ah, there it is. Is it this? Yeah, just use that scroller. <clears throat> the, one of the billboards is here. Did it show? Yeah. Well. It's actually at the wrong place, but right there. And then another one of the billboards is down in this area. Hold on. It's not exactly the quickest thing I figured out. Well, come Near on. the clover leaves. Huh? Near the clover leaf. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm trying to click and it's not. It's <laughs> okay. This is a cursor. If you could use that, that'd be good. Right there in that See, yeah, it's mm -hmm. down here on this corner, uh, down below the clover leaf, right yep. to the right of it. Yep. Uh, those two billboards, the city has done a letter to Greenbelt that we agree to use those funds for the maintenance, upkeep, and the development of this parcels, these parcels. Hold on, can you restate that? Mm -hmm. the, the 
We're under contract with those billboards, yeah. and the city has agreed, I believe it's 32000 38000 a year that we'll use those funds until the lease runs out to actually do the maintenance upkeep of, this prop of these properties. Nine years left. I think, yeah, I think the uh, current lease was just renewed about a year ago, so yeah. there's about nine years left, and the value in the appraisal um, of the revenue that'll be, the, the value of the appraisal, half of that is from the revenue generated by the billboards. Yeah. So if the billboards are not there, um, the appraised value will be half of what, what it is now. So roughly $300,000 of it. This shows the zoning of the properties. Um, the yellow over here is R2. That is actually the R2 in front of it is actually the cemetery. The easiest way to actually view the property is actually to go into the cemetery and then go to the back corner. Um, it's R2 in the back. And then over here, you've got some B2. There is a little bitty um, red parcel up there on the right hand corner. See where the yellow is in that little bitty red parcel? That is actually a. Um, going to be a, uh, gosh, my mind just told me blank, 20 units of affordable housing that's going to be homeowner occupied. They're actually groundbreaking on um, in October. So the thought is that's going to be a lot of new residents in that area. And also that yellow area is undergoing kind of a renaissance with a lot of those homes being redone and hopefully more homeowners moving into them. Um, this area is so convenient. It's kind of why people are moving into it. And so it's just the red that's the, that are the properties that we're talking about, right? Not the, not the up in the orange part. Actually, the big yellow to the left and the two reds, the two big reds. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then there's, if you look up there, kind of going towards 26, see how there's one parcel that's red and yellow mixed? That parcel as well. And then those red parcels over there. You can actually, if you drive down right along 26, you can actually enter the parcel up there where the red and yellow parcels are. There's a gate and a fence right there because of the billboard. So all that would come down and there would be some access there. Um, the easiest way to access it, of course, is through the river. Um, these are some pictures. Uh, these were actually taken from the appraisal. Um, it shows you under 26 where the billboard is um, and then some of the back pictures. We actually, when we did a site visit, we actually went down into the um, graveyard and looked at it out that way. Yes, sir. The city has about uh, $4.5 million left in our allocation, so this money would come from that. Mm-hmm. Yep. That greenish color um, piece, like up in the top corner. Left side, uh, top left. Is it yellow? No. That's the bend. That's the event. No, this that's this right here is actually the cemetery. That cemetery to the yes. left of that is yeah. the bend. It's the okay. bend. That's what I was trying to Oh, ask. okay. That's what I was going to ask. Yes. But the parcels the O2 that's just south of the cemetery now it's working is is one of the parcels. yeah this is one of the parcels it yeah. is yes it's there's there's four to the west of Sam Rittenberg or Cosgrove mm -hmm. um the it's, two two small ones up there up yeah, top this, where they these access little the, small ones two below this that. big red one this yellow one and this one um and this is actually the cemetery so when you come in if you go straight back you can actually get out of your car about right here. There's actually a gate here, too, and there's a gate on this other road up here. And where's the high, the, you said 17 acres of high ground? Uh, this, yes, this sir. Piece, 16 piece. acres of high. Okay. Yeah. I believe there are some little bitty actual islands back in this area. Yeah. And there is um, probably this acreage right up in here is high as well. That's what we bought. Yeah. So that gives you the, the parcels and the locations. Okay. All right. 
was there a question mode now? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think this thing should have scored higher, Shannon. I don't know what the problem is here. Um, is it is the billboard thing considered a match? Could be. I mean, or we're going to go ahead and use could it. Could that I mean, revenue come back to the Greenbelt Fund? No, it's, it's going actually back to this park. To the park. Mm -hmm. And yes. then have y'all, but, but that's undefined. Right. We actually have a letter that he has that actually says it's going to be used to pay for the development, uh, maintenance, et cetera, on, this, on these parcels. Next question. Yes, sir. Is that lease, is there an extension on that lease or nine years is dead? Uh, we'll be the owner at that point. I think that's what we're going to try to do is get rid of it after the nine. But if it does, then we would, of course, continue to do this. Sensibility is not good. What? Sensibility is not good. We'll better say it loud. Mm -hmm. The access, I, I don't see it being, I mean, going through a cemetery, is, I'm looking at trying to figure out. So, your best access point is through the cemetery? No, you can actually come down. Oh, crud. Hold on. Plain. Actual I easiest. Harvey, I see Harvey Street. Yeah, the easiest access, let me see if I can get his little clicker to work again. It it's actually, the... when you come, you take a right off Azalea, mm -hmm. you turn this way and come straight down, it actually brings you right here into these parcels. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see it. Yep, and there's a gate here right now and a lock, but that would be removed. And mm -hmm. then once it was cleared, when we were there, it was um, three weeks ago, and I don't think any of us had snake boots on, um, and the grass was probably at least knee high. So you would easily be able to access it from right there. And the majority of the highland is on that island, which is off of Cosgrove. Well, I think the highland is going to be in this area and then back in here, some of the other. Right. Mm -hmm. How do you access the piece off of Cosgrove? Um, you could use it. I mean, that's we haven't gotten that far in planning. We're just trying to get it. Secure. Okay. Okay. Is it vulnerable to, to transaction? Um, they have... Years ago, the, the company that owned it was actually looking at putting a marina in the spot. Um, DHAT, or I'm sorry, DOT, from what we gather, said they wouldn't support it. Um, they have made some comments when Ray was alive that it was vulnerable because of some of the zoning. So, and we had always talked about if in actuality the pedestrian bridge from West Ashley to over here takes, becomes a reality, you're going to need some kind of a drop off point. And wouldn't this be great if it dropped off and then you had a pedestrian walkway and through here anyway? So, so currently there's no way for a pedestrian. If the bridge were to land, say, on that island, there's no current way for, to, to walk off of that island onto another pedestrian way, right? So that would have to be part of that as well? That would be part of the okay. pedestrian bridge, yeah. We have this property, looking back at some of Ray's old notes, has probably been under discussion for the past um, five years at least, and the issue has always been the billboards because of the value. And the issue being, just I, I don't understand, I don't the follow that. The billboards basically double the value of the property, mm -hmm. and it took a while with the company agreeing to sell, we had to get make sure to include that billboard value. Okay. And that's and that you said that's going to go in. I I agree with Beezer what he was alluding to. What I, I would have included that as match, that would have helped improve the score. I mean, we could do so. That's fine. Like I said, we have sent the letter, and Greenbelt is in receipt of that. And then the other is, um, is there was there any attempt to make any kind of public support or get any kind of public support, maybe from the Ben folks or the cemetery or anything like that? No. Ben is currently for sale. Meaning you don't need their approval or it doesn't matter. It kind of doesn't matter yeah. if it's going to sell to somebody. Or yeah. And I mean, to be, these neighborhoods are all very much in transition. Um, this would be a great access for them. Um, you know, it's just sort of one of these things we've been working on for so long, just trying to get it under ownership. The owner, the cemetery is actually owned by the same family we're purchasing this from. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, if I could, as far as the match goes, I think I would feel comfortable in counting this as match if one, those proceeds went back into their Greenbelt account 
to be reused for future greenbelt projects. Um, or if that, you know, I'm a little, little concerned about the maintenance part of it. Um, I could see, you know, we, we often you we often count the cost of future development of projects as part of match, but typically not maintenance. That's just something that is um, that we haven't. There's no precedent for that. So if if it were if it were pared down to development of that site, and maybe there's some more details on. Um, what that development looks like and when that would happen, I would feel comfortable as counting it as match. Or if those proceeds went back into Char North Charleston's green belt, the allocation to be reused on other projects. So, but so I just did the quick math. So it's like two hundred and eighty-eight thousand over the next nine years in total. So realistically, if it were to go towards development, you know, you'd have to wait because, you know. A, couple you know a couple grand a month for you know is not going to do anything to build you know to to be part of development it will be it, done sooner than that i would imagine but right now we've got park circle finishing up we also just closed on ingleside a couple weeks ago and noisette um, that whole walk path is actually um beginning to really take shape. I don't know if you've been over the pedestrian bridge lately, but you're also starting to see some of the walkways along the water as well. Which look awesome, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I have, a, I have a motion, if we're ready for that. Real, real quick, one, one, one <coughs> quick question. Could, could it be a reimbursement for development? The, you know, oh, is that where you're going? <laughs> take it away, Bezer. <laughs> okay, I would motion, <coughs> I would motion for approval pending the either of these two options. Either the green belt money is reimbursed in entirety for the for the billboards through nine years, or there's a very defined public access park with decent access that it's clearly mapped out and with a time frame that the that could be considered either a match and or that the billboard money is going to um i would guess that that active accessible park would be more than the billboard but whatever um it's like it's, it's such an amazing piece of property i don't see why it wouldn't you wouldn't get on with that i guess is the point um so that would be my motion i would motion for approval that either the green belt money or the green belt is reimbursed for the billboard or there is a defined park that the billboard money plus goes to which would increase the score were we to rescore it but that would be my motion i think we would be more um willing to do the public access i mean we have right now 4.5 million still this is only going to take 700,000 out of it um, I think we'd be more willing to work on the public access specifically off this area. Um, go ahead and getting the fencing down, getting some parking, because once you're in that area, you can really start to move. I think that's where we're probably going to start initially with public access. Well, well I've put out that, that motion yeah, if y'all no want to talk about it or amend it or whatever. Yeah. Um, we need a second one, right? That's right, for discussion. Discussion. Yes. I don't think this is ready for a vote. There are too many things that we've talked about. Like, why don't we do this again and have them come back with it? I agree. Defer it. Yeah, I think we should defer it. Okay, well, motion for that. Just to let you know that if defer. we don't get this, this property will, we probably won't be able to close but, by the end of December. Nora, just a quick question. What do you think, just for you know, discussion's sake, what, what in your opinion needs to be more defined? I just think that it was, it's, it seems unfinished. It seems that some of this stuff could have been taken care of beforehand. Scoring. They have no match. We typically don't provide match in our project. Scoring just concerns me. What What's it? the score? We don't see the scores. Excuse me? We don't see the scores. Uh, 
we do, and it's not good. It's 40 mm -hmm. or 42, and like that would be unprecedented to pass that, just so you that know, would, like it would not, not be what? consistent with our history to pass one that low. Um, well, again, we don't see the score, so we don't know where it could come up. Well, it comes off of your application. Right, but again, we don't see the score sheet. We don't get a right. copy of it. What did you score it as, as the applicant? I don't score it. Well, <laughs> I don't score but, it. Huh? Only well, there's point points values points. for every question, Only and you select points. an answer for it. But it, it's right, it doesn't calculate it at the end. We calculate it manually once it's submitted. Right, but don't, don't the applicants have? Yeah. The opportunity to see the score. The, you don't know what the, how own. you scored it? No. So just to be clear, um, when they fill out their application, the second half of the application is all the criteria that relates to the score. So um, I think the first question is worth eight points, and it asks, you know, which of these green belt definitions does this project meet? Um, and there's different points for each answer. So you go through 16 questions. Um, and those point totals total up to 100. Um, and one note would be if, if the match, if half of the value of the appraisal were accounted as match, that would be 100% match, um, raising the score by 15 points. So if there are, there's a way to, um, to work that out, that would raise the score. I think we also talked when we were out there about when we got access back behind the graveyard and looked at some of the grand trees as well. I think that goes to Nora's point that, yeah. you know, there is a way to we did. to do a little bit more thorough job on this and to raise and to be aware of what the score is. Um, I, yeah, I think I'd probably agree with Nora. The only thing we would ask is it, it still, we try to do this quickly because, like I said, we're under contract. We'd have closed it by the end of the year. I, I'm, I'm happy to help continue to make it move, but I, I need something that I can bite into so I can feel good about voting for it. I mean, we can increase, we can do like we were talking about, about the match. That's no problem. Uh, yeah, maybe work with the staff to, to go through the application and see how you can increase the points. I think it needs to be deferred. I think you have to make a motion to that effect. There, well, there's a motion on the table now with there the second. A so, a second. so the, either that gets voted on, or, or um, can, you can you rescind can, that. Can you? I, I, I keep asking questions here. But can we do something? Could we maybe, like, at the next committee meeting, at the next time it's presented, present the newer scores? In what is it, October? Well, that's where Snore's going with the deferment. Can you? Can you explain? how your motion would address some of the things that you've heard. Well, so my motion was either the green belt is reimbursed for the billboard money, which um, effectively replenishes the North Charleston um, green belt funds by 300,000 over nine years. Um, and then it can sit there and be dormant I could, I could sort of see that being dormant and the match comes up. Or the city can put money into the project. Yeah, they can. They can city kind of, can fund it. Yeah, city can fund it, or it can, or it could even sit there until they come up with a plan. And I think it fulfills, it, it would come up 15 points, which would be, what is that, 57? 57. Um, or similarly, they use the, they develop the park now using the billboard money probably plus some north charleston funds and make it a park go ahead and make it a park um and that too would bring up the score even higher i think this then, park it, will be probably developed in the next three to five years looking at the other parks they'll be finishing up yeah <clears throat> well then i mean that changes everything if, if you can just define that we're currently um getting ready to have a new administration. <laughs> yeah. And so we've got some, a lot, um, of a lot of changes going on and we've got a lot of huge projects that are finishing up. Yeah. Well, I, could, could I we... was hoping that would be a solution, um, but that deferral works too. If y'all want to vote that motion down and go to deferral and we can still get it done this year, Shannon. Okay. 
Mr. Chair. I would think. It doesn't go to the committee. That's correct. In October. That, that's correct. So if you defer, um, then what you would want to do is defer it until a specific date, give them a specific time frame for the deferral, uh, let them know what you want additional information you want them to bring back, which we've discussed. Um, that would be more detail on plans for the park, um, what development looks like of the park. Um, maybe work on that application again, take a closer look and grab some of those uh, low, low hanging fruit points and, and resubmit that. And then we could defer and do a subcommittee meeting immediately before the full GAB meeting next month on October 11th. Um, so that the subcommittee would have an opportunity to review this again with more information and an updated application. Um, and then make that recommendation to the GAB, but you all, for it to get to the GAB, you, you have to make some recommendation. And that gives them time to go back to their planning department to try to come up with a better plan. The plan, we're not gonna be able to come up with a plan and the planning department doesn't actually develop parks. We go through a third party. Um, mm -hmm. So that's not gonna be something feasible. We're not gonna be able to get a park plan in the next 25 days. Which I, I think, you know, a right. lot of times we buy, if we, but properties are purchased without a plan. Plan, plan. right? So that, that, you know, that I mean, Ingleside was purchased with no, no plans from us. If we subtracted, that was four million dollars. Well, a commitment to open the park by a certain date would certainly raise the score as well, and I think address some of your concerns. I mean, if we committed as far as access by twenty eight. What do y'all do? Y'all vote and. I kind of like following along with what Eric has suggested is let's give them the opportunity mm -hmm. to um, come back, we use that date of the next committee, the full committee. So that gives you almost a month to not necessarily come up with a plan, but at least to address the match um, and some other elements that might help improve the score. That's what happened. We'll meet at 930. So I think we need to vote on the other thing now. Go ahead. Either that or you, you, could, with, we'll you could also withdraw. Uh, I'll floor. withdraw. I'll withdraw. And then okay. whoever seconded it would need to withdraw as well. Withdraw their second. second. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> withdraw. Now we're going to the next motion is to Nora. To. Um. So I think that would be deferral, <clears throat> deferral until October uh, 11th. Um, and bring back more information on what we've discussed so far. And we'll for, meet at 9.30 previously before our 10 o'clock board meeting. Or 10.45, whatever, 9.45, whatever time we think we need. We can work that out. Yeah. 9.30. Okay. I motion that we defer until the 11th and give you time to come back to us with some answers to the questions we've asked. I second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 We'll see you in October. All right. Next project we have for your consideration is Beefield Community Park, submitted by Low Country Land Trust. It's a fee simple urban project on James Island. Um, four acres would be protected and turned into a public park. And the request is for $712,500. Again, this is the urban unincorporated project, um, would also be eligible for the small landowner program. And they're offering a 35% match. I've got Sam Sewell here today. He's the community lands director for Low Country Land Trust. Sam.
Hello, everyone. Uh, like Eric said, my name is Sam Sewell. I'm the Community Lands Director at the Low Country Land Trust. I'm excited to present this project to y'all, um, the Beefield Community Park. Um, it's located, um, it's approximately four acres located in the Beefield community on James Island. Um, it's made up about eight parcels. As you can see um, by the parcel lines, it's um, already, a lot of the entitlements have already been done by the landowner to um, begin the phasing it for development. Um, so this project will kind of be addressing the impending development of the, prop of the property. The um, kind of the backup, our community lands program at the Land Trust, um, we established it um, when we merged with the East Cooper Land Trust. And so it's building on the work that East Cooper Land Trust um, uh, has been, had been doing with uh, establishing public access properties, as well as working within our settlement communities in Charleston County. Um, so this fo project follows um, a similar pattern to Natalie's project as well as work that ACLT was doing. Uh, it follows like a buy, protect, transfer model in which we purchase the property, uh, protect it with the conservation easement, and then transfer it to um, the community organization to manage the property. So the project's um, goals um, there's kind of four main goals of the project. First one is to prevent the incompatible development of the property. Um, like I said, the landowners, um, you know, priority was to, you know, they purchased the property to develop it. Um, and so they, if this does not go through, um, they will be um, pursuing development of the property. Um, their current plan right now is an 800 subdivision uh, of, the, of the property. Uh, the next goal will be to provide public green space, um, both to the Beefield community, but also to the larger uh, community at whole. Um, as then, the next one will be to preserve the Beefield community. It's uh, one of our recently uh, designated communities. It was designated in 2021, I believe, as a historic district in Charleston County. So it does have S3 zoning on the property. Um, and that was done, led by the community organization uh, via their president, George Richardson, but also in collaboration with the Historic Charleston Foundation. Um, and then the fourth goal of the project would be just to protect open space and natural habitat on James Island and within Charleston County. Uh, quick note, this is the road that the property is located on, Arsburn Road. It's currently a dirt road at the moment. Um, they are working with um, county council and another in the county to have this paved, but this is a pretty awesome kind of Oak Alley um, and scenically it's a pretty beautiful property and the property um, these oaks on the left side of the, of the picture that's the road frontage of the property. So the financial details uh, we had the property appraised at nine hundred fifty two thousand dollars. Um, we were we negotiated with the landowner and we uh, locked in a purchase sale agreement of eight hundred thousand dollars. Um, so we've, we are going to the Conservation Bank for $100,000 a match and then asking $712,500 um, from the green belt. That $12,500 will cover our closing costs. Um, and so that comes down to a match of, I rounded up on the, on the match, so it's 35, I think it's 35.6, so I went to 36. <laughs> uh, the, so phase one, I kind of mentioned the, um, it's our kind of buy, protect, transfer model. So phase one is to purchase the property. We, our purchase agreement expires um, at the end of this year. Um, so the landowner's been very explicit. Um, they're willing and open, but they were very clear that, you know, if this, this, if this opportunity passes, then it, they will be pursuing development of the property. Um, and so the it kind of, the impending development is there. Um, the second one will be to uh, place a conservation easement uh, on the property. So BIDNA is the acronym for the it's Battery Island Drive Neighborhood Association. So Beefield Community is located on Battery Island Drive, um, hence the name. Um, and so they are a 5013C3 um, C3 nonprofit. Um, and so Civic Association volunteers, you know, um, it's not a homeowners association as some might um, have, have thought in the past. 
Um, and then the phase three would be the transfer uh, to the property. You know, in terms of the transferring and the ownership of, of the property by bid note, you know, you know, one thing that I've kind of proactively have been addressing is establishing them with the amount of re a solid amount of resources in which they can maintain the property. Um, and so they've been around for since 2010. So they're well established in their organization and their leadership. Um, but, you know, it was a priority of mine within the, our community lands program to kind of go a step further as we enter this perpetual partnership with them to make sure that they have the resources they have to make to, to achieve the vision of the property and have it be a, a really nice uh, place for the community and, and public to come as a whole. So um, I've engaged the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, to incorporate this property into a larger grant that Low Country Land Trust has been a part of with the Fish and Wildlife Service for over 20 years. That's be our Coastal Partners Grant. So those discussions are still ongoing. The, our grant just ended our latest cycle, so we'll be renewing that. And I don't have any official numbers to, that's why I didn't include them, because I didn't want to be a little presumptuous. But it's, you know, I'm, we're very confident that, you know, this will be included. And they actually have a separate pot of money that's just become available to serve underserved communities, um, like the Beefield community. Second uh, resource that I've been exploring I've begun conversations with the South Carolina Association for Community and Economic Development, SCACID. So they have a grant cycle specifically geared towards uh, community farms and community gardens. Um, so they have a February grant cycle I've already spoken to them about that I'll be um, submitting an application in um, to help establish a community garden on the property as well. Further discussions of engaged with Marilyn Hemingway, who you heard from earlier, um, with Kiowa. Um, she's with the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce, as well as the um, Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. So uh, our, our conversations um, have kind of been progressing with her and her involvement um, with this project as well. So just trying to layer, you know, make sure that we have, you know, the Beefield community has the amount of financial as well as logistical support uh, to make sure this everything goes smoothly once they own the property. So kind of addressing the four main project goals on um, the incompatible development. Um, so like I said, um, protection of this property would you know, prevent uh, the proposed eight home subdivision. Um, it, you can see this is TNC's uh, climate, cha uh, climate resilience model um, and the entirety of the property is located within migration space for tidal habitat. So flooding is a really huge issue in the Beefield community in this area. So any sort of intensive development like is being proposed would have a really severe impact on both the existing homes, but also future, um, future, you know, the future of the area and the land. And so um, there's actually a tidal creek that abuts, um, that comes up like right around here. It's been channelized and so you know, putting in the subdivision would come in and this, this would be a cul-de-sac and the homes would be around right around there. So that would just, you know, they would, it would cause a lot of, a lot of issues um, flooding wise. The, you know, the protection of this property also meets Charleston County's comprehensive development goals um, of protecting cultural communities within the urban and suburban areas. Um, so it kind of meet, matches, meets that, that goal of protecting lands um, within, you know, intensive development for open space. Um, and, you know, this area is getting more and more pressure um, as each day, um, you know, with Folly Beach's recent, you know, uh, decision with the short-term rental. We've already seen the, the prop this property right here has been, a, uh, was annexed out of the community into the city and has been approved for a 16 home subdivision and a bed and breakfast. And so thankfully that's on the outskirts of the community, but we kind of are starting to see the pressure come into the community and this property is located right in the heart of the community. So um, this development would really be a kind of sucker punch and, and really kind of put a hole right in the community. Um, in terms of the public green space, um, there's a really severe lack of public green space in this corner of James Island. Um, as you can see, this is the star's location of the property. 
Um, we, our, we, our GIS department, went and um, mapped out every public accessible green space within five miles of the property. Um, the nearest one is about roughly 2.5 to 3 miles away, um, not really, you know, walkable distance. And so, um, you know, that green space would be, is, is very important um, to establish um, both in the near term, but also for the long term development of, of James Island. Um, this property is, this project is, is reactive and proactive in the same way. It's reactive to the to the development threat of the property, but also it's, it's proactively establishing um, a green space within an area that, you know, we definitely anticipate is going to be continuing more and more development pressure on the area. Um, so in terms of the Beefield community and preserving the land and the community, so like I mentioned, um, the Beefield community is a Gullah Geechee settlement community. It's been recently uh, designated by Charleston County as a historic district. Um, you can kind of see right here, this is the WMB track. This is the land that the Beefield community was established on. This is Old Folly Road. That kind of, I found this map in the Avery Center. Um, and uh, so the Old Folly Road used to go right to the Beefield community and connect into Soul Agree. Um, when they developed the Folly Road, the new Folly Road, they actually cut this connection off to Soul Agree. And B so Beefield and, and Soul Agree were very much um, a connected community. Um, that also severed Beefield's accessibility to the Sea Island Farmers Lodge and other, you know, different, you know, kind of community resources. And so the, at the moment, they do not have a place to gather as a community. They don't have a, a community you know, an area for them to, to convene at. Um, and so that's, that lack of social infrastructure is a real hindrance on the communities, especially our Gullah communities that rely on those, those central locations um, for their kind of culture. And so it also would help, this project would help preserve the history of the land. Um, this property is located in the, in the center of two Civil War battlegrounds, the Battle of Secessionville and the Battle of Grimble's Landing. Um, the Grimble's Landing was interesting enough, um, I don't know if y'all have seen the movie Glory, but this Grim, the, the 54th Massachusetts Voluntary Reg Regiment, I believe, um, that this, this was their second um, engagement prior to the battle um, that, is, that is depicted in the movie Glory. I believe it's the Battle of Fort Wagner. Um, and so it's kind of them you know, that regiment being one of the first African American regiments and having them fall, this would be their, one of their first engagements on this property is kind of, um, I thought was pr is pretty special um, for this community. Um, and finally, the open space um, and natural habitat. Um, it's majority of the property consists of a coastal maritime forest. Um, it's pretty much completely dominated by Longleaf Pine, I mean, excuse me, by Live Oak. Uh, and then uh, the protection of the property also will allow community uses, um, such as community gatherings, community gardens, and, and passive, just passive uses. We, we will be allowing the potential for the construction of a small um, community center. Um, you know, the maximum impervious surface, as you'll see on the next slide, is, is 3,000 square feet total for the property. So it'll be a very small building. But like I said, they don't have a place to gather at the moment. So we would like to offer them that opportunity if they would like to, to pursue it, um, to construct that. Um, the restrictions of the property, um, so the impervious surface would be limited to 3,000 square feet. That's about uh, 0.17 of 1% of the property. There'll be no residential or commercial structures like I said, the one building for use as a community center is permitted. Common park amenities such as picnic tables, benches, um, other, any other th kind of things you can think of. Um, infrastructure related to a community garden would be permitted. Um, and then also that would be limited into the impervious surface restrictions. Um, and then this last one is important. You know, we will be placing an affirmative requirement that the general public have access to the park under the same rules and regulations as the Beefield community members. So um, Beefield community, they would be the managers of the park and they would, we would have established rules and regulations, but all, you know, the, the, it would be written into the easement that is 
you know, required that everyone has full access to the property. Um, and that's, that's about it. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah, here. Question. Um, so just to, just to be curious and maybe highlight the incompatible development, um, it looks like it's eight lots on four acres. So probably a little less than a half acre lot or mm -hmm. something right that with the access. What are, what's the, you know, an example of an average lot size in the B field community? Um, so I don't have that specific information. It is zoned S3. So the eight home subdivision would fall within the, the zoning, uh, definitely. Um, the, the development of it, you know, there is no, there's no cul-de-sacs located in the Beefield community. There's no, you know, developments of that type, you know, located within the community. Um, you know, with the, there has been precedents already set of annexing out of the S3 zoning into the city of Charleston by that subdivision down the road. Um, so there is that, certainly that concern there as well. Um, and, you know, there has been, the Historic Preservation Commission has, has been able to um, stall the development of the property thus far. Um, but, you know, I think it's only a matter of time. And the development, you know, I don't know how much um, flooding and, and sea level rise is put into zoning and the, you know, with, when it comes to that, um, it is a, it's a low ground area. And the homes I've, you know, just working with the landowner and seeing the plans that they've, um, that they've kind of have envisioning, it's a lot of concrete and it's, you know, it's a paved road. It's, you know, it's eight homes. It's, it's going to have a, a, a significant um, impact on the, on the area. Um, this property has never been developed and it's ever, there's never been a, you know, that we had a phase one um, done on the property and, it's always through its history always been ag land and or forest land so it kind of the characteristics of the property very much meet uh, the open space um, qualities so um, yeah and the incompatible development also kind of goes into the nature of the Beefield community as well so not only is the land not in my opinion not suited for that kind of development it also the community it would it would be very out of sync with the community um, so. Are all the utilities available? Water sewer available on they, the site? Uh, they have not. I don't see. Pray they have not gotten. They've gotten the commitments, but not. I don't believe no they have. To serve. They haven't lined it up. No. Yeah. Because that brings the value of the property to what they're thinking. Unless they have a letter to serve a water sewer, they don't have sewer. What these sites perk to put. So then. The, the value of the property might not be the same, so I didn't see the appraisal to. Okay, is there an appraisal? Yeah. Yeah, Compass South, before, Travis Avant, Compass South performed the appraisal. It's attached to an application. That's that 952. That's satisfactory. Yeah, I mean, that's satisfactory. I just haven't seen it though. Just, just, that's the question I'd have. Is yeah. water and sewer available to the site? Water probably is, sewer, my question mark. Mm hmm. That would drive the value and also put eight per sites per. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, I, I believe that's it's in, low, included so that would be... in the appraisal that's included in the application. Okay. So y'all should have that. Okay. It, it seems sort of like an island unto itself. Like it doesn't, it doesn't look like it has great connectivity to just things that we normally look at in terms of ease, ease of access mm -hmm. and pedestrian access even car access on a dirt road so so like are you, clearly y'all are convinced that this thing will be utilized by this mm -hmm. community but can you just speak to yeah. that a little bit so yeah certainly um that's kind of goes into the proactive aspect that i was talking about you know um they've already you know the same meeting i was at um with the community uh council member boykin was there to discuss you know Osborne road the plan is for that road to be paved um, and so the accessibility to that area is increasing um, you know and it's kind of just anticipating the future um, of this area and and the future of this of James Island you know its development is, is is increasing the area and and so you know 
the prices are only going to get more and more expensive. The need's not going to go away. Um, you know, the need for public green space in a community that's going to be experiencing increased development pressures um, is very obvious. And I think, you know, it, this would give us an opportunity for connectivity um, and to, to have an epicenter in which we can then build content connectivity out and connect it to existing infrastructure. Um, it is right, you know, it's maybe, I think maybe a five minute walk from Folly Road. So there is that ability to, to connect it into Folly Road. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the pro, it's, it's the combination of there's an immediate threat. This property is getting developed. It's in the heart of a, of a historic district, a, a community that, that doesn't want this development and it's gonna have a significant impact on the community. And then can we use this as, as leverage to further increase accessibility and further increase pedestrian access in the area and use this as a, as a launching pad? Um, and so that's kind of where I see it. Um, and so, and that's where the connectivity aspect uh, I feel is, is there. Hmm. Okay. I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Nora. Um, you discussed the considerable value historically of the land because of the um, Civil War events mm -hmm. that occurred there. Um, and you, excuse me, mentioned, I think it was the Historic Charleston Foundation as a partner mm -hmm. with you. Um, your match is not great. Why didn't you ask them for funds, or did you? Um, the Historic Charleston Foundation is, can, is already, um, you know, so, uh, I, they've already contributed a significant amount of work into the Beefield community. So they were the ones who funded all of the application process for submitting to, for, you know, they worked with the Beefield to get the historic designation. They are working with them to pay for their historical marker. Um, and so they've already kind of committed a significant amount of finances into the community. Um, and so it was not the, you know, financially, um, it was, it was, you know, we, I certainly can go back to them, but they've kind of, that was where their contribution to the community as a whole has been thus far. For whoever, do we have a, a zoning map or at least a jurisdiction map available? I, I don't have one on the slide, no, ma'am. You're wondering how close City of Charleston is. <clears throat> can you speak to that at all? Any clue how? Uh, yeah, I mean, let me see if I can find a map. But I think, I think you're wondering if they could annex in and get greater density. Of the historic preservation, the new overlay district with the county is to ensure that the development pattern matches the surrounding settlement community development pattern. So I'm not, I guess, I'm really concerned that something would occur here that is not in keeping with the rest of the community. But if there is contiguity possibility to either, I guess, James Island or City of Charleston, then that could change things. You said one of these properties just annexed. Yeah, so it's, I guess I can't, I don't know if I can, it's about three properties over, maybe 100, 200, 100 yards um, over, like kind of in this area, um, is, the pro is the property that's located that's been annexed out and in, into the city. Mm -hmm. um, and they've also, you know, while I think, you know, personally, in my professional opinion, um, the opportunity for planning unit developments is, is very much there within the S3 zoning, very much there within our historical districts. Uh, you know, there's already been, you know, pushbacks, you know, as we saw last night, the county council meeting about reducing, you know, the, the oversight of the historic uh, preservation commission. So, yeah. you know, while I, I absolutely love what you know, the Historic Preservation Commission does and in full support of, I am not inclined to rely on that for the protection of these communities um, in the long term. And I think there needs to be projects like this to ensure that. And so um, that's kind of how I feel about it. Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, interject for a, a moment. Um, one, I will point out that 
when while there was a meeting about the historic preservation ordinance last night, uh, then that's not the issue when before you guys today. And I will say that the Historic Preservation Commission, and their role and, and is not to prevent development, but to, to review whether or not the development that is proposed and fits, and then therefore that commission does not look at things such as density. Um, they simply look at the design of what the developer wants to do. As long as that developer meets the S3 requirements uh, for zoning, uh, he's allowed to, zone, to build whatever S3 allows for him to build. Um, and as far as the annexation, that, that's something that we're not sure of. And at the moment, we'd have to look further into whatever this property owner is proposing or contemplating, but nothing has been presented to the county on that fact yet. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so it is. it does abut the city of Charleston properties on either side of the property. The other problem, or not maybe not other problem, but a problem I see here is we also just don't have the money. And this doesn't quite, this doesn't strike me as an extraordinary opportunity at this moment. And maybe you could convince me otherwise over yeah. time. I don't know. Um, but um, is it extraordinary? Somehow, like, is there some reason why we should like reach and like go rework our allocations and all that on behalf of this property? Because that's what it's going to take to 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 make it happen. And Ford spend, and I'm also hearing kind of grumblings that the the value is a little bit in question relative to perk and all that stuff. Um, yeah, in terms of the valuation. Um, I'm pretty, I'm extremely confident of the valuation. The property okay. that I mentioned that's been planned for the 16 homes development, it sold two years ago for $1.3 million. Um, and it's only, it's I think five acres of developable land. So um, this, uh, the majority of this property is developable, if not entirely of it. So from a valuation standpoint, I'm, I'm very confident about the value of it. Um, in terms of the quality of the of the project, you know, I would encourage you to go out there um, and, and step foot into the Beefield community. Um, it's pretty George, the George Richardson, the president. He kind of uh, he kind of refers to it, it's like a land, you know, stepping back in time. You know, it's it's you know it it is you know you walk in, you know, you drive in, and it's a dirt road on James Island, which is pretty crazy, pretty phenomenal. Thinking about how developed the island is, and it's you know entirely dominated by live oaks. Um, it's you know beautiful maritime forest. It's right. It's adjacent to Grimble Farms um, property, which is a long time conservation you know you know priority. Um, from a battle from the Civil War aspect of it, you know it is in the center. It is you know I find it very you know, moving and, and that, you know, people physically died on that property, um, fighting for a community like Beefield to be able to own that land and be there and live on that land. Um, and so being able to tell that story, having the opportunity to tell that story, I think would be um, pretty phenomenal. Um, and just, you know, the, I think if you also understand the history of the Beefield community over the, especially over the last 10 years and the, the kind of the fights that they've been having to go through to maintain, um, you know, their way of life and maintain their, you know, their culture that we have already acknowledged is something of value via their historic designation, you know, whether or not it's with, uh, I'm sure everyone knows about the barrel um, and everything that went happened with that, you know, which was, the, you know, this, this bar that essentially opened up on the corner and their patrons were blocking driveways and, you know, dogs were pooping in people's yard and, you know, it was causing this whole havoc for this very quiet community. Um, and, you know, they were able to, you know, get, you know, and fight that and, and have that stop. And, you know, this would, and then along with their historic designation, this would be kind of, further catalyzing and further building on that momentum. You know, we've already had members of the community come forward that have not historically been involved, you know, kind of people of my generation and have volunteered their time to, to you know, to work and, and maintain the property. So it's kind of already um, galvanizing the community just and it hasn't even really happened yet. You know, just the thought of it is kind of motivating people. Um, and so, 
you know, I think it really is a special place. I think it's a special community. I think we've acknowledged that by its designation that it is a special community and it's and it's worth protecting. And um, you know, from a funding standpoint, that's out of my purview to to advise y'all on how to do that. That's not my you know, I don't wanna I don't wanna overstep that. Um, I would say that, you know, it's an unfortunate situation that the urban unincorporated fund was one of the lower funded pots considering the va value of the land that is in, you know, and the communities that are located within the urban unincorporated uh, areas, which is predominantly our settlement communities. Um, so I think, um, I, I don't think that that I would hope that that would not be a hindrance onto the on y'all's uh, valuing of, the, of this project and, and how important this this project is to, to Charleston County and, and the local community. Any more questions? Do I have a motion? Do I have anything? to approve and have discussion. I'll second. I'll second for some discussion. Okay, we have a first and a second. Okay, discussion. Um, I mean, I think realistically the use of this park, if it becomes so, would be by the Beefield residents. I know it's talking about public access, but this would be their, you know, potentially community center, community gardens. I don't think that's a bad thing, but I just think we need to, like, you know, realize it. It'll, it's like a little, you know, essentially pocket park within a community. To your point, Beezer doesn't have some of the other, um, other projects we've seen that access available to that. Even if it's, you know, the road gets paved and there's sidewalks there, it's, I think realistically it's gonna be their spot. Once again, I'm not saying that's a right. I'm not saying that's a negative thing at all. I just think that that's realistically what we're looking at. Good news, bad news. Next door, Grimble Gates will be developed at some point, which is 850 acres. Good news, bad news. Or just news. What's the good news? <laughs> Eric, you said something about small <laughs> landowner. Do we have a little bit of that pot? This part might be. We do, only about $50,000 in small landowner. It might be um, up by it. I think, you know, when, when you all made the decision, I think it was back in January, to essentially um, table our forward spending policy that we were working on for a year. We said, well, let's kind of track projects and point out the ones that would not have been funded. This would have been one of those um, because Urban Incorporated is so forward spent. Um, and then the score doesn't rate as exceptional, which still wouldn't have given them the full amount that they needed to secure this property. Um, so, you know, I would recommend if you do vote to approve, um, there needs to be some recommendation on where this funding should come from, whether it's to continue to forward spend, which is still allowed under the rules that we're under, um, or maybe make, make some recommendation to the GAB uh, on reallocation of funds, either to our Urban Unincorporated or to the Small Landowner Program, which this one would qualify for also. Um, and of course, council would have to approve all that as well. But I think there should be some clarity if you do vote to approve on consideration and, and approval is the fact that it is a settlement community um, and they are under tremendous threat. Um, you know, we've done this in the Mount Pleasant area, Phillips community, and we've done it, I think, twice at least. Mm -hmm. um, similar. And, and yes, they are pretty much limited to the use of that community, um, but I, and which I think is, is, is a good thing. Um, you know, because of what it creates within that particular community. And so, you know, I, I do have a concern with where we are with, with the funding um, in the urban un, unincorporated. Um, I, I think we will, I think you're correct that the settlement communities are probably mostly in the urban unincorporated area. And, uh, and if we're gonna 
see these types of requests to try to preserve parts of them for open space, we're going to have to really think about what the funding should be. Um, so I don't have the answer there <laughs> for, for the future. But um, I, I guess that's why I'm inclined to at least um, consider this for approval now is, is preservation of these communities. It's clearly important to um, um, the county as well. I mean, the county has created this historic district. Um, Mount Pleasant tags along with that. We, we support it. Um, and uh, so, I don't know, I guess that's, that's reason anyway for my consideration of this request. Yeah, and I'll just say the you know this this project is it follows very closely the model that was set by the Phillips Community Park as well as the Seven Miles um, Park as well. So, the kind of following the president's set that green belt is set with those projects as well. And those were both fun, those were several different projects um, and one you know. In each community, it was several different projects to, to make the footprint of what they have now. And those are both drawn from um, varied pots, urban unincorporated and small landowner program, kind of mixed and matched. So Eric, how, how does that work if you said there's about 50,000 left in the small landowner program, we would make a recommendation that council in incorporate that funding into this project is that what you were alluding to or, or um, suggesting you know what we talked about back during the five-year plan review was potentially recapitalizing the small landowner program it was originally funded for projects just like this which are really directed at settlement communities um, for properties for land that's under 30 acres and it also provides some of these neighborhood and community organizations the professional expertise and support of the Lowcountry Land Trust, who um, just just like this project is, they do all the work to get the property, put restrictions on it, help the organization with capacity building, and then transfer that over the property over to that organization. So, to me, this is exactly what the small landowner program was made for. Um, but there's only fifty thousand dollars left, and that's not one that can be forward spent. That money was originally, I think it was 1.4 million was taken from rural funds and put into this small landowner program. Um, and it can be property in either the urban or rural area, but it has to be under 30 acres. And then they also follow this model of having low country land trust support um, throughout the process until the end owner takes ownership. So if you wanted to fund it, fully with small landowner, you would need to make a recommendation to county council to say so, as well as where that money should be moved from into the small landowner program. And how much, because we're probably going to have more of these projects coming through. Is it possible to split the money between urban and rural? Whatever money we put into the small? Sure. It's possible that could be your recommendation to council, um, you know, maybe a percentage across the board from every allocation would go into the small landowner program. Um, and of course that the GAB would also need to recommend that county council ultimately would have to approve that. Any suggestions, any motions? We have a motion and a second. We do? Yeah. So, we move forward and all in favor? Aye. 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 What's your answer? Quick call for a roll call vote, please. I am. Roll call. Aye. I've got to pass for the moment. I'm staying for the moment. Go ahead. Aye. Aye. have it. Okay. Great. I mean, that's simple. Yeah. Eyes have it. Great. I'm glad. <laughs> I was just going to come back with like some idea of where the money was going to come from. That was the only that's change. Right. Mark, do we need each member to vote? Go ahead, Caesar. 
uh, and it'd be up to the, to the chair, um, and it's really not necessary. I, I, I believe at the moment, uh, and it is three, three eyes and uh, an abstention at the moment. And so I have to vote, and I abstain too. So we got three eyes and two. And so uh, the, the motion carries with, with, with three votes in favor and, and two abstentions. Right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. That's kind of my thought, and not to mention the full gap meeting. Right. Next project for your consideration is a minor improvements project from the town of Sullivan's Island, station 26.5 boardwalk. Boardwalk would be approximately six feet wide and 480 feet long. Uh, it would cost of $51,000 from Greenbelt from town of Sullivan's Island, Sullivan Island allocation. And they're offering 155,000 plus match, uh, which represents 304%. And I've got Joe Henderson here, deputy, deputy administrator for the town of Sullivan's Island to give his presentation. And while Joe's coming up, I'll pull up that presentation. Where's Andy Bank? I'm gonna go to He is off island right now, but he's still at Town Hall. Has not re tell retired him, yet. Tell him we miss him. Let's try to do that. I sure will. Let's go. Let's be quick. Um, thank you all. I'm Joe Henderson right. with the Town of yeah. Sullivan's <laughs> Island. Um, I appreciate the opportunity <laughs> to uh, present this project to you for the FY24 cycle, um, which is, as per normal, uh, construction of a public boardwalk. Station 26 and a half in Bayonne Street. Um, this is one of 28 public beach access points, which is um, uh, shown here on the overview. Um, and circled there, highlighted, is the approximate location of station 26 and a half. Um, you know, these uh, boardwalks, these access points provide free beach access and parking to uh, 300 to 500,000 vi visitors annually, and they are continually uh, falling apart on us and so that's why we use these funds each year um, to rebuild those. Uh, we think the project meets several of the Greenbelt program objectives which is preserving natural resources and green spaces, providing minor improvement for passive green space activities, uh, raised boardwalk construction through the town's accreted land um, which is um, under the protection of the um, low Country Land Trust, and also providing safe public access uh, to oceans and marshes. So a little bit about the project. Um, as Eric mentioned, this is going to be a wood construction with composite decking, which um, lengthens the life of these boardwalks for us. We've done this for the past several years. Um, no handrails needed um, uh, because it's only going to be 12 inches to 18 inches from grade. Uh, it's going to be six feet wide and uh, 480 feet long, uh, as mentioned. Uh, so here are some of the problems uh, that we have with all of our boardwalks. Um, we have localized flooding after normal rain events, um, and it's impacting the island more and more simply because Sullivan's Island's an accreted land and accreting uh, beach, and so um, as the beach accretes, then we get uh, more flooding between the residential property and the berm of the beach. Um, so the project estimate uh, currently is at 206,000 for the construction at 480 linear feet. Um, so this 51,000 will uh, contribute to that. Every little bit uh, makes a bit uh, a difference for us. Um, as the other part of our match, we're also replacing the existing 850 feet of boardwalk and possibly extending that uh, another 100 linear feet to the berm of the beach. So as these dunes accrete, we need to extend um, uh, the boardwalks on out to get folks um, to the beach without getting their feet wet. So the total project, um, uh, expense for constructing this boardwalk is 461 estimated and uh, so as I mentioned every little bit 
helps. Um, we've had ample community support, not only from the surrounding residents, but also town council um, giving their full endorsement. Also, we have a letter of support in our application from the Low Country Land Trust, who's the holder of the conservation easement. And um, that's pretty much it. Happy to answer any questions. Questions? I'm on your boardwalks all the time. I think they're great, so helpful. Can't imagine getting through some of those spots without them. I motion for approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 You got it. Get out. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Uh, no. Oh, I just said before you open them up. You have me at hello. Right. Next project for your consideration is Town of Mount Pleasant, uh, Mount Pleasant Way, Park Avenue Boulevard, and Carolina Park Boulevard Trails. Um, I know James has all the information in here that I was going to present, so I'm going to turn it straight over to him. I don't know where he went. Oh. <laughs> he's sitting back there. <laughs> I see him. He's right outside. Okay. Don't get in there, no. and, and Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I'm recusing myself from this item. Go. I'm recusing myself oh. from this item. Okay. okay. James Aton. Good morning. I think it's still morning here. Barely. Oh. We're getting we're getting close. I will, I will hopefully be finished by the time the morning ends. Uh, again, as was stated, my name is James Aton. I'm the deputy director of the Capital Projects and Transportation Division with the town of Mount Pleasant, and we have the Carolina Park and Park Avenue Boulevard Mount Pleasant Way Trail System, as you'll see. A little different from the other applications that you've received today. This is the spokes portion of the Greenbelt's Hubs and Spokes project. Um, and in an effort to be expeditious, uh, this is, these are just overviews that you have seen. This is your program, um, so I will breeze through these and get to the meat of the presentation. This is just talking about the Mount Pleasant Way as a whole, meeting the goals of the Greenbelt Commission and other regional plans. This again is just an, a, a quick graphic of the Mount Pleasant Way spine route, 47 miles, so that'll be a number that I'll reference here for this specific application. Um, it's been master planned, it's been adopted, we've seeked we have sought and been successful in previous applications um, that are going through design. Here are a few photos of existing segments, um, a few photos of existing secondary routes, as well as green belt and greenway routes, uh, as well as the parklets that are along the, the proposed route. So getting into the specific project, um, this is the Park Avenue Boulevard in Carolina Park Boulevard Trail. It's a proposed 8,300 linear foot project um, it does require allocation of property or recreational easements from 11 properties for and the town is requesting a total of six hundred and twenty thousand and two hundred dollars for those purchases with a match of over a hundred percent eight hundred twenty eight thousand eight hundred dollars and i'll break that out here in a few slides so again, all of those properties that are proposed to be impacted are commercial properties. All have been reached out to and have, and have been corresponding with the town in relation to the design of this project. Uh, Right-of-way services within the request is 147,000, while the actual cost for that right-of-way or recreational easement, $473,200. As far as public meetings that were held, we, we had our typical online surveys that we host. Um, as well as an in-person meeting. The in-person meeting had about the same amount that we have show up for most of these events, uh, just over 15. Uh, but the online survey did have a, a good showing of 163 respondents, um, the majority of which supported the project. Um, and these are some of those quotes, snippets from that. Um, let's make it happen, wonderful idea. Love to see more of these projects. The only opposition that we did receive, I'll call that out, was really concerns about golf carts on this path system. We, we get this as a main concern for any of the Mount Pleasant Way section. Um, but for this one in particular, uh, one of the ways that we're addressing that is we're working with Charleston County through one of their pilot projects for resurfacing of warm mix asphalt in place for Carolina Park Boulevard 
and Park Avenue Boulevard, where we will be allo reallocating lane space to develop um, bike lanes and sh or share situations on those roads and as such reducing the overall speed limit, making them eligible for golf carts to ride on that roadway. So that is one way to address the main concerns that we heard from the public. As far as connections, this is a slew of, of the connections that will be made. Uh, obviously this area is developed. You can see in the plan right here, where across from the Wando Library, that's the last owned parcel by Carolina Park Development. Um, the town has received a conceptual plan through our design review team process for that to be developed into a town center style development. So a lot of good activity for those adjacent residential areas to access it through this path. Um, currently the sidewalk, while it does exist on one side is disjointed on the other. Um, it connects to existing multi-use paths, both in neighborhood and part of the Mount Pleasant Way section through here and recreational facilities at Park West um, and the Carolina Park Recreation Facilities, both of which are two of the three largest town recreation complexes um, that we currently have in use. Uh, and then to mention the schools that we connect to, Wando High School, Carolina Park Elementary, Cario, Pickney, and Laurel Hill schools over in the Park West area, as well as our um, Oceanside Magnet School up Faison Road, and then the Wando Library, which isn't technically a school, but still has a great educational purposes. So summary of the slide, again, proposed 8,300 linear feet, back to that 47 miles. So this is about 1.5 miles. So we're looking at 3% of that overall spine route. So that's one thing I really want to highlight for you guys today is that this is a, a significant amount um, of, that, of that spine route that's come through in, in one single application. It connects to a slew of different, uh, both recreational, educational, and commercial needs. And then the last thing to highlight as well is we do have some great public-private partnerships that have come out as part of this investigation. The Carolina Park Development has donated the property associated with this path alignment on their property, as well as the adjacent Jeep automobile um, dealership, which is just to the north of Costco. They have donated the property as well. So those are included within the match that you've seen in the application. And then furthermore, since the submittal of the application, the town has engaged in further public-private partnership with the Carolina Park Development, receiving $5,000 to go towards the design of this project. So timeline-wise, we have sought a scope and fee from one of our on-call consultants, Mead and Hunt, to go through the design of this, which should take about a year, um, 12 months to 16 months to complete and permit. Uh, and then the town has several grants that are currently either under review or will be submitted um, between the USDOT grants as well as local state programs like the South Carolina Recreational Trails grant that this project will be eligible for for funding. And that is my quick presentation. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Any motions? Can I make a comment? Sure. Um, this is to the gentleman. Um, in its entirety, this project is nothing short of spectacular. I have no idea how you guys have been able to do all this, and I applaud Mount Pleasant for this, for doing this. Thank you. Can I have a motion with that? I motion to accept. In a second. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Ayes have it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, sir. That's all we have for you. We'll see you again probably at 930, um, but I'll be sending an email out with that on uh, October, October 11th, October Wednesday, October 11th. But we'll get you the information, the updated information from City of North Charleston in advance of that meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, meeting adjourned. Nice. I had to hit that, right? Yeah. You really Made it official.